right, uh, this is Steve Carr, and he's going to be talking to you about his first love, which is Kansas Nationals. And uh, Steve was in my uh, class out at the ANA in, in Colorado Springs, and we planted the seed and watered it. <laughs> and you water right. it every year, so. <laughs> Uh, Peter's correct on that. I didn't know what else to do at summer seminar one summer, and I thought, well, nationals sound kind of interesting, and I knew Peter from the Smithsonian, so why not take a class from him? I did it, and ah, I'm hooked, you know. <laughs> um, it's led to where it is today, and it'll probably lead to other things in the future. Anyhow, these are Tales of Kansas National Banks, and my name is Steve Carr. So. We'll start with that. The information is very basic. Um, I love Kansas National Banks, and I love their notes. Um, I'm from Kansas. It's close to do research around. Some really interesting stories. Um, some of these tales are really unusual. I don't know if they're extremely unusual, like it's going to throw you into catatonic arrest or something, you know. But they are unusual. I hope you enjoy them. And I also want to stress that this can happen in any state. So if you're a national collector from New Hampshire, you can find interesting tales about the national banks and the notes from your own state. And it's just getting out there and digging. Um, for me also, this is one of the neatest things about collecting nationals because I can have a piece of paper in my hand and I can think about what happened 100 years ago at this bank. Who was the president? Who was the cashier? Were they robbed? Did the people have something against the bank, or did the bank get into receivership, or how did it die, you know? So anyhow, they are unusual, and this presentation will look at a few of these unusual things, and these are only a few of the ones that I've found. The first is the only national bank with Army in its name. Uh, this was kind of the headline on the advertisement for this thing, and it's also the only one located on an Army base. Unique, unique. The First National Bank of Leavenworth, Kansas, charter number 8796, is the only national bank that fits this description. Um, it was originally created to handle Army funds for the soldiers at the fort, and it's also located at the, port, the fort's post headquarters. We'll get to that a little bit later. Army National Bank of Fort Leavenworth was organized on June, 10, June 8, 1907. It succeeded the Army Bank. Um, a little bit more about that in a minute. They issued only five and ten dollar notes, red seals, date backs, plain backs, 29 type 1 and 29 type 2. And they issued until the end of the National Bank Note era. Uh, the total issue was about half a million dollars <coughs> and their circulation uh, when they quit issuing notes was twenty five thousand dollars. So it was a fairly decent sized bank and there was $1,670 in large size notes out in 1935. Uh, this note, or notes from this bank are very, very popular. They were more popular 10 years ago than they are today because everybody wanted to have an Army bank note. Uh, today, yeah, it's not so important for people to have that. Maybe it's a generational thing, whatever, but they're just not quite as popular. There is a small size note from the bank just to kind of get your eyes going there, the Army, Fort Leavenworth, the Army National Bank of Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And Fort Leavenworth was established in 1827 by Colonel Henry H. Leavenworth. Name's the same, right? Okay, well, he was actually the commander of the troops that were protecting the routes along the Santa Fe and Oregon trails. And Congress said, we need a fort here. We need something to help protect local settlers, travelers, etc. So he was instructed to build a fort on the east side of the Mississippi River. He took his crew out, they checked out the sites, and they found that the best site was on the west side of the Missouri River, otherwise it would be a Missouri bank. So they started building the fort. It took them about two years to build it, they built it, and now we had a place for the soldiers to stay where settlers could settle. You know, it was something that was a little bit safe. Um, the city of Leavenworth was founded shortly after that, and um, it was a nice location. They were located south of the fort and right on the Mississippi River, so they had protection, and they also had a way to conduct commerce. And the Leavenworth area, Leavenworth area led the state in trade. 
uh, population and industry until about 1885. It was the booming part of Kansas. Since that point in time, Leavenworth is not as important as other parts of the state of Kansas, but it is still a place that has a rich history, and it's basically Kansas's portal to the rest of the world. And I'll get to that in a second. Fort Leavenworth has historically been known as the intellectual uh, center of the Army because they do a lot of training there, uh, particularly for higher ranking officers. Uh, it's the home to the United States Army Combined Arms Center, the CAC, which includes the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. This is the big college for the military, for the Army. Uh, U.S. soldiers and allied soldiers, countries that are on our side, attend there and they have fantastic graduation ceremonies if you're ever in the area and they're having a graduation go to it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, virtually every major in the Army and every general has been to this college, has completed the work there. You have to do that in order to advance in rank in the military. Fort Leavenworth is also the home to the Military Corrections Complex, which is the Department of Defense's only secure facility to keep prisoners. Several years ago when they thought about doing away with Gitmo, where were we going to put all of the terrorist prisoners? Well, Fort Leavenworth was the only place that we could really put them in the country. Talk about a hubbub. I mean, the whole area around here just was up in arms. We don't want terrorists in our neighborhood. We don't want them for neighbors. Uh, the idea was kind of dropped, but maybe it wasn't dropped. I don't know. And finally, Port Leavenworth National Cemetery is on the grounds. It's about 36 acres. Henry Leavenworth is buried there. Uh, Tom Custer, who is George Custer's brother, is buried there. A lot of the, the Bighorn Battle soldiers were reinterred and moved back to Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay, there are 35 notes currently known on this bank, and they break down as follows. There are two red seals, 110 and 15. No date backs. It's kind of interesting. Date backs are actually one of the tougher types of series to get. There are 12 plain backs, five fives, and seven tens, and there are 16 type ones, which are 11 fives, five tens, and this includes one uncut sheet of number one notes. So that's six of the 11 right there. And there are five type twos, one five, and four tens. And many of these notes are third party graded because, again, they were very, very popular, and they still are, and most have auction appearances. So you can see what the price data is on them. And here's a picture of basically the Army Bank, and this is about 1900 before it became a national bank, and it was located in the port or the Fort Headquarters building, which is the building right there. And I have another picture, which is taken about 10 years, 15 years later. This is the Army National Bank, and it's still in the, port, the Fort Headquarters building, taken a little closer. And we've got a large size note there, so at least you get to see the large and the small of the thing. And the Army National Bank of Fort Leavenworth is still operating today. They're on the base, they're at 330 Kansas Avenue, and there's also an office in downtown Leavenworth at 2901 South 4th Street. So if you want to go see the bank, you can go see the bank. Okay, the second sale is about when number one notes were the last issued. Okay, everybody knows that number one notes were always the first notes issued for a bank. They started the numbering with one and went up from there. Okay, well how could they be the last one? Did they just get one sheet or two or three if they held different types of sheets and that was it? Eh, no way that could happen because a bank had to have $6,250 in currency circulation and you can't do that with three or four sheets. You have to have more than that. So number ones, twos, three, fours, five, six, all these numbers were issued out at the beginning. Okay, every time a new series was introduced we went back to the number one serial number again, except for the 1882 date backs to value backs and the 1902 date backs to plain backs. They didn't start again on number one on those guys, so no way to get a number one as the last issue from one of those. And number one notes as a last emission could only happen under certain circumstances. Number one, the bank had to liquidate or be placed in receivership. 
This had to happen shortly after a series change was made. Okay? And also the comptroller's office kept some currency in stock for every bank. So they could pay out from what they had in stock instead of ordering new sheets to be printed. Okay. This happened not once but twice in Kansas where number ones were the last notes issued. The first one is for the First National Bank of Peabody. It's charter number 3134. Peabody is just west of Emporia if you're familiar with Kansas. Uh, it was chartered in 1884 and they issued only big notes, 50s and 100s of nationals. Um, they issued brownbacks, red seals, datebacks, plainbacks, and I should have put up here 29 type ones too, but that's, that's the issue here. The bank liquidated in February 1931. It was the depression, things were tough, the bank just couldn't make it in their current state. So they liquidated. This was more than a year after the large size currency was discontinued and small size notes were issued. However, the comptroller's office didn't have enough currency to send them all of the last settlement and they included one sheet of $100 bills. That sheet was a number one sheet. Okay? And none of these notes are known today. Just think about that, having the only number one small size sheet from a bank. That would be pretty neat. Okay, and the only note thrown from this bank actually is a 1902 plain back 50. Um, that was in the Steedale Lions collection probably 25, 30 years ago. Um, it was in Leroy, Kansas for a long while, but I have no idea where it is today. And there's a picture of the First National Bank of Peabody. It's this building right here. I'm in your way, aren't I? Okay, the second bank was the Caldwell National Bank, charter number 6333, nice charter number. It was chartered July 10th, 1902, red seal notes. They issued 10 and $20 notes and they liquidated in June of 1909, which was soon after they changed from the red seals to the date backs. Um, when they did this, the last issue to the bank had a single sheet of 10 by, 20, 10 by 3s, 3 by 10s, 20s of 1902 date backs. One sheet, four notes of the new series, and guess what? All four of these still exist today according to the National Bank Note Census. Um, I'll get a little bit more to that, and they're all grading about uncirculated, which means they've just been handled over the years. I've never seen these notes, so I don't know if they're in a sheet form or if they're in individual form. According to National Bank Notes Census, they are not sheet form because they're not listed with the sheets in the census. So I'm assuming that there are four of them out there. There's also one red seal known on this, note, on this bank. I have not yet found a picture of the Caldwell National Bank. I haven't found much of anything about it except the fact that they issued number ones as the last sequence. Okay, third tale, the last horse blankets issued to a national bank in a town named after a horse. Think of the, the completeness of that. I mean, horse blankets to a horse, yeah, you need horse blankets for a horse. Okay, many most, or most towns and cities in Kansas are named after the local geography or after a person. We'll get to that a little bit later too. But one town in Kansas was named after a horse and they even had a national bank. Okay, to tie the whole thing together, large size American currency notes were called horse blankets, nicknamed that because they were big. Uh, you could wrap them on this, a horse, put a saddle on the horse and take off and you were in business. And actually a note wouldn't have worked that way, it's too small for that, but they appeared big to people. Now imagine owning a last horse blankets issued to a bank named after, in a town named after a horse. It's a challenge. It's kind of a neat thing if you can accomplish it. Okay, located about 60 miles southeast of Wichita, Dexter, Kansas is famous for the helium that was discovered there in the beginning of the, night, or the 20th century. At this point in time, helium had no real use except for balloons. Fill them up with helium, they'll go up because helium's lighter than air. 
Uh, this is kind of interesting because they don't mine much helium there anymore, but in the center of town there's this little pipe coming up with a nozzle on it and a valve, and you can open the valve and helium will come out. You can pump up balloons, take a breath and talk like Donald Duck, you know, it's kind of neat. Um, Dexter the Horse was a gelding uh, trotter who was owned by Robert Bonner, who was the editor of the New York City Ledger, and they also named Bonner Springs, which is about 20 miles west of here, after him. Um, Dexter won 48 of the 50 races that he ran. He was a champion of the times. Um, get to that again in just a second here. When the town was being organized in 1870, Dexter the Horse was touring the area and racing. People loved him. You know, they'd go out and they'd pet him and they'd look at him, they'd gawk at him. And so they decided, well, what the heck? Let's name the town after the horse. They named the town Dexter after the horse. And Courier and Ives actually immortalized Dexter here with a picture. There's Dexter. It's the only thing I've got. No pictures are known of Dexter, but at least we've got that. Okay, the First National Bank of Dexter was just one incarnation of a bank that served the Dexter city for more, town for more than 100 years. The bank started as the Dexter Bank in 1885. And the bank had the misfortune of being robbed by the Dalton Gang on September 17, 1892. The Daltons made off with 2,000 bucks. The money was never recovered. And we'll hear more about the Dalton Gang as we go along. The Dexter Bank became the Dexter State Bank in 1901, and in 1904, the bank built a new building. It was the first brick structure in town. The First National Bank of Dexter, Charter Number 9225, was chartered in August 1908. The bank had, was in business for about six years until it was liquidated and merged with the Farmers and Merchants State Bank on August 1st, 1914. The First National Bank of Dexter is best known for its uncut sheets. In the early 1980s, all of the notes known from this bank were in uncut sheets. There were seven of them. Okay, and these seven included serial number one sheet and serial numbers 429 to 434. These 429 notes and 434 notes were the last ones issued to the bank. And I've got another little story about that too. It'll come up shortly. Since then, new no, no new notes have been found on the bank, and two of those seven sheets have been cut, the number one sheet and the number 429 sheet. At least gives people who are collecting Dexter notes a chance to have a note in their collection without having to buy a sheet. But uncut sheets are actually more readily available than individual notes. Those individual notes were sucked up and they just kind of disappeared. Occasionally, you will see a number one note at auction. Okay, this is the only bank in, whoops, this is the only bank in Kansas where both the first issued notes, the number ones, and the last issued notes, the 434s, are known. The Farmers and Merchants State Bank continued as a locally owned and operated bank until July 8, 1973 when it was purchased by a Kansas City banking firm. Uh, it was sold several more times before being closed and placed in receivership by the Kansas State Banking Commission in the late 18, 1980s. Dexter no longer had a locally operated and owned bank, but they do have a branch bank of the Union State Bank of Ar Arkansas City there today. So, And here's the First National Bank of Dexter, right there. This is called the Banker's Block because the Farmers and Merchants Bank was right next door to them. And here is the bank today. Looks different. It is different. Today it's the home of the Dexter Historical uh, Society Museum and they have inside there a safe, the teller counters, um, a lot of basic items. Uh, we'll get, I'll show you at least one of those. Um, there is a lady who is curator there so if you're ever in Dexter and want to stop by they have Zero banknotes there from the First National Bank of Dexter, but they have some other interesting things, including a savings book. Uh, sometimes people save those. That's kind of neat to see that. Does anybody notice what covers that savings book? It's tape. They had a problem with kids and adults 
coming into their museum and stealing things, tearing things up. And the way to preserve them was to put them on a table, take some tape, put it over top of it. When I was last at this, this museum, um, I tried to pull the tape off and tried to save something. It was just going to take the surface off of everything. It was good tape. So we just left it the way it was. Uh, but anyhow, there are some things there that may not be in the best of condition, but they're still there. And here is a note from the uncut sheet. <coughs> You'll notice the names on the, the president and the cashier's seat s lines there. They're coffee and light. Um, these are not the people who were the president and the cashier of the bank. They were the Silliman brothers. Okay. Uh, these two here were from Winfield. And when it came time to close the First National Bank, merge it with the Farmers and Merchants Bank, uh, they came down and they did the paperwork, they did all of the other stuff that was done, and they signed the last sheets. When they signed the last sheets, they didn't put them into circulation because the First National Bank of Dexter no longer existed. What did they do with them? They saved them. Those are those sheets, the last five sheets, that, or last six sheets that I mentioned earlier on. And here we go with this guy right here. Notice the serial number, 434, the last sheet of notes issued to the bank. Some people like to collect the last notes from the sheet of the la notes from the last sheet that was issued to the bank. That's kind of their mantra. To have them all in one piece is kind of interesting. I don't know of any other Kansas banks uh, where the last notes issued were are still in sheet form. Okay, my next tale is about a leap year plate date. What's a plate date? Well, we all know that plate date is when they made the large size currency, they put a date on it. And this date was determined by a number of different things throughout the history of our large size national banknotes. But when we get a plate date that comes on a day that only happens once every four years, wow. Well, think about this. It's a leap year. We get an extra day in February. If that day is not on a Sunday, it's a business day for a bank. Okay, well, in 1904, it wasn't on a Sunday. It was on a Monday. Uh, but it was a business day, so that's the date that they chose to organize, and that's the date they got on their plate dates. I don't know of any other uh, leap year plate dates across the nation, but I also have not studied that, that much. So there may be one, there may be two, there may be three. I don't know about them. <clears throat> the First National Bank of Clifton was organized on Monday, February 29, 1904, and it was chartered in March. In 1904, the date of organization of the bank was used as the plate date. They were organized on February 29th. That's the plate date they got. They didn't have to recharge her in 1924 when their 20-year charter would expire because on January or July 1, 1922, Congress passed an act on extending the charter life of all national banks to 99 years. Since they didn't have to recharter, they didn't put a different date on their notes for a plate date, by golly, every one of the large size notes from Clifton is a leap year plate date. Okay, and this bank is also known for its uncut sheets. It seems like Kansas has a few of those. Um, finding an uncut sheet is usually easier than finding a single note. There are a number of single notes, and I might even say that it's about even in finding one or the other, but I seem to find more uncut sheets than I do single notes. <clears throat> there is a single note. Um, another peculiarity with this bank is that the bank's officer's signatures never show up on the uncut sheets. They bought cheap ink to put the signatures on there. The ink just kind of disappeared as time passed. This one does have a few signatures. That's the reason I got that, because it's the only Clifton note I've ever seen that has some semblance of signatures on it. <clears throat> There's a picture of the bank in 1910 when they organized, or shortly after they organized, I guess. And here's the interior. This came from the C. Dale Lyons catalog. It was a picture in there. 
Okay, who was a national bank officer killed during the Dalton robbery in Coffeyville on October 5th, 1892? This is a kind of a, a mystery to me when I first started investigating it, because nowhere did it say who it was. It didn't even say that a bank officer was killed, it just listed the people. And then I had to find out who the bank officers was, and I finally figured out that one of them was in there, and I found confirmation that a bank officer had been killed. So, long story here. Um, there are many different tales of what happened this day in Coffeyville. Every one of them claims to be true. Unfortunately, that can't be true. You know, they have different stories, and only one of them can be the actual story. But it's like anything. Get two people together to watch one event, and you're going to get two different stories about what happened during that event. That's just the way we see things. We see things differently. We notice different things, etc. Okay, this tale is the best bet on what I think happened. Again, I am not an expert on the Coffeyville Raid, the Dalton Gangs, but it's what I think makes the most sense. And I will also try to tell different parts of the story if it had there are two different parts and that makes a difference to my presentation here. The Daltons were a gang of outlaws who robbed trains and banks in Kansas and Oklahoma Territory in the 1890s. They also were well known for supplying liquor to the Indians in the Oklahoma Territory. They were not a very good group of people, I don't think. At least historically, that's what people say. And there's a picture of a couple of the wanted posters for them. You'll notice that they're Grat, Emmett and Bob, the three Dalton brothers, and they're on the other one. These guys have mustaches, these guys don't. They like to use disguises. The robbery in Coffeyville on October 5th, 1892 made national news. Uh, it was all over the country because it was a pretty big bloodbath in the town of Coffeyville. Small town USA, all these people killed in the bank robbery, my gosh. The Daltons were also famous at the time, and the Daltons were basically wiped out in this robbery. So, newspapers everywhere had the story. It even turned into a bit of a Dalton craze. Today, there are museums. There are two of them, at least. You can see Dalton's original equipment. You can see things from the raid. You know, you can see everything. There are books, or there are movies. And there are books. And there's even a band. I put this one out here because you can see that he's wearing the band's name on his shirt right there. Yeah. So I've never heard them, don't have a clue what they do, but they exist. On October 5th, 1892, the Daltons robbed two banks, the First National Bank of Coffeyville and the C.M. Condon and Company Bank. The C.M. Condon Company and Bank became a national bank in 1903, but that was 11 years after the robbery. The banks were across the street from each other. And at this point, I want to take your indulgence or ask your indulgence to put up with a couple of slides that are not really in sequence because they're kind of telling the story before I tell the story. If I don't show you the pictures first, it, I think, is a little more confusing. So hopefully the pictures will make what I say a little more understandable. The Cheeky Daltons decided that they wanted to do something to put their name in the history books. They were going to outdo Jesse James. Jesse James had never robbed two banks in the same city at the same time. So they were going to one-up him. Hmm. Good luck. The Dalton brothers were Bob, Gratt, and Emmett. Bob was the oldest and he was leader of the gang. They also had accomplices for this raid who were Bill Powers and Dick Broadwell. Now you may see other names for these two people because they went under a bunch of aliases and depending on where they were and what time, they may have used a different name. So that's one other problem with the story here. Uh, that when they arrived in Cor Coffeyville shortly after 9 a.m., they found that the streets were more crowded than normal. One reason is that the Daltons had lived in Coffeyville for about five years in the mid-1880s. They were known by the people of Coffeyville. Their parents still lived in town. Okay, well, how are you going to pull off this thing in disguise when everybody knows you? That's one strike against the Daltons. And there is a city, or the downtown of Coffeyville. The scene shows 
First National Bank, the Condon Bank, and this is Isham's Hardware Store, which we'll get to in a minute. It's another important part of the story. You'll also notice that there are three guys running out of the Condon Bank right there, and there's all this smoke because of the citizens in the town are just shooting the life out of the Condon Bank, and you basically see all the smoke from it. And here's an overhead view of the thing. Right here is the Condon Bank, right here is First National Bank, and Isham's Hardware. And what happened here is the Daltons came down what is now called Death Alley, hitched their horses over here. They then marched down the alley here, some went to the Condon, some went to the First National Bank. As the robbery progressed, got over, the people who were robbing the Condon Bank came back out in the front, you saw the picture there, and went up the alley, and the ones that were robbing the First National Bank went the back way because they stepped out the front and they ran into a barrage of bullets and they said, this isn't going to work. So they went out the back door and went around. The Marshall Connolly arrow on there is for the town marshal, T. Connolly. Um, he organized a number of people into a posse and they were going to take care of the Daltons. They went around the backside and we have what is called the alley fight. The robbery started at 9.30 a.m. After hitching their horses in an alley across from the banks, the Daltons, with false beards, marched down the alley, three in front and two in the rear. Gratt, Power, and Broadwell were in the front, and they entered the CM Condon and Company Bank, while Bob and Emmett crossed the plaza of the First National Bank. At the Condon Bank, the three, three bank employees were forced at gunpoint to put money into a sack. One teller, Charles M. Ball, declared that they couldn't get into the vault because there was a time lock on it. And it was going to take 10 more minutes, according to one story. Another says 45 minutes. I think it was 30 minutes, because this was 9.30. The bank was supposed to open at 10. OK, but the thing is, they didn't have a time lock on the vault. The other thing is, the Dalton people didn't even check to see if the vault was open. They just sat down and waited for half an hour while you're robbing a bank to get into the vault. Okay, well, dumb point number one. Okay, at the First National Bank, Bob and Emmett took three employees hostage. Uh, the, the bookkeeper, the bank bookkeeper, Albert Ayers, and the teller, W.H. Shepard, emptied the teller drawers, and the cashier, Thomas G. Ayers, who was Albert Ayers' father, emptied the vault. Uh, Bob and Emmett then forced the three bank employees out the front door and followed them. Now you remember, Isham's Hardware was right next door. Isham's Hardware had a whole bunch of weapons and ammunition in it. And when people figured out that the bank was being robbed, the banks were being robbed, they went to Isham's. They got guns, they got ammunition, they got ready. Okay. Bang, 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 as the three bank employees from First National go out the door and the two robbers, well, you're not going to go into this and run across the street. You're going to go back in the bank. Here, uh, citizens of Coffeyville, aware that a crime was taking place, basically opened fire. And according to the Coffeyville Journal of July, or October 7, 1892, the citizens of Coffeyville poured about 80 shots into the windows of Condon's Bank. Okay, the gang members in the Condon's Bank returned fire twice, according to one source, and seven times, according to another source. The crowd on the street also fired at Bob and Emmett and the three First National Bank employees. Okay, well, there's a picture of the Condon Bank right after the robbery. You'll notice we've got a couple of holes in the glass there. There are holes over here. There's even a hole up there. I mean, they just blasted that place. Emmett later described how First National Bank cashier Thomas G. Ayers was killed. So you already know the answer to the question I started with. Emmett said, Bob and I started to come out the front way of the bank. Bob stepped on the street and shot his Winchester south once, which goes towards Isham's hardware. We then went back and went out the back. Met a man with a six-shooter. Bob killed him. Well, this is one tale. The man with the six-shooter was supposedly Thomas G. Ayers. Okay, the thing is, if you think about it, you got a front door to the bank where Thomas Ayers 
and everybody else had gone out. They go back in, they go right out the back door, and Thomas Ayers is by the back door. How could he do that? He'd had to run all the way around the block to get there. He'd had to get a six-shooter in the meantime. I don't believe this story. According to it, Thomas was shot in the groin and he died the next day. Okay, one story, but I don't believe it. Uh, Bob and Emmett then ran around the block and entered the alley at about the same time that the group from the Condon Bank also entered the alley. So we've got them all there now. And this is a picture of the First National Bank inside. On the left is Thomas Ayers, and on the right is W.H. Shepard, the teller. It's the only picture I've ever seen of Mr. Ayers. Uh, Mr. Ayers, incidentally, is part of a large family of bankers in Kansas named Ayers. They basically started in Leavenworth, and they spread throughout the state. Okay, in the alley, the outlaws were fired on by the citizens, and a battle began, which lasted about 12 minutes. Um, when it was over, Bob, Bill Power, Bob Dalton, Grat Dalton, and Dick Broadwell were all dead. Emmett was badly wounded. Um, he was shot through the right arm, through his left hip and groin, and he had about 20 pieces of buckshot in his back because somebody came up behind him and just blasted him with a shotgun. Okay, well, this is kind of interesting because all the stolen cash from the First National Bank was recovered. Some of it had buckshot damage to it because Emmett carried the sack with the money over his shoulder and it swung around around his back when he was shot. So it probably saved his life, but it did some nasties on some of those notes that were in there. According to another account of the robbery, during this what they call alley fight, uh, Bob Dalton took his rifle and basically aimed and shot somebody over by Isham's hardware, and that was Thomas Ayers. Shot him in the head and he died instantly. Whichever tale is correct, you know, Thomas Ayers was the only National Bank officer killed during this robbery. He had been the cashier of the bank since 1885 when it was first organized um, till he was killed. Uh, the bodies of the dead uh, gunmen were first held up by people in town, just somebody could take a picture. They were then dumped in the city jail, which is right by the death alley. Um, they were thrown in there and just piled up overnight. In the morning, they brought them out, put them in a hay wagon, arranged them, and lots of people took lots of pictures. Um, photography was a new thing. It was interesting. Hey, this horrible event happened. We survived. Let's take pictures. So I've got a couple of pictures here. The one on the left is the day of the robbery where they've got the local law enforcement officers holding up a couple of the Daltons. And on the right, we've got the four dead Dalton gang members laying in the, the hay cart. Emmett, he was the only survivor. He was sentenced to a life sentence in prison at the Kansas State Reformatory or Penitentiary at Lansing. He was a model prisoner, and many people thought that Emmett was kind of conned into it. He was the youngest Dalton, and the older brothers used undue influence on him. But people from Coffeyville think that Emmett was really the leader of the whole thing. So, you know, you got both sides of the story. Anyhow, he was a model prisoner and he was released after 14 years. He went to California and became a successful real estate developer. He co-authored or authored a couple of books and he even appeared in a couple of movies, most of them about the Daltons. And are there any notes from this robbery still in existence? That was my big question. You know, I'd love to have a, a note that survived the Dalton's robbery. Well, it has to be from the first national bank because the Condon Bank wasn't a national bank then. There are two notes from the first national bank that could have been in the robbery. First one is a serial number one $10 brown back. I don't know if it was or not. They did get the money out of the vault and if a banker had it and kept it in his bank in the vault, it probably went with Emmett. Um, who knows on that one. And another one is serial number 491, plate position A, which is in choice extra fine. That one probably was taken during the robbery. I looked up the, the treasury numbers and it came out just before the robbery. So it's possible it was in there. I've never seen either of these notes, never heard of them, don't know where they are love to see them. So if anybody knows where they are, I'd love to know. 
Um, I wonder if Thomas Ayers signed either of these notes. I'm pretty sure that he did because he was the cashier. Okay, final statistics. Talk about the killed ones. There were four in the Dalton gang. Bob Dalton, he killed all the citizens in the raid except for Marshal T. Connolly. Grant Dalton was killed. Tom Evans was killed. Richard Broadwell was killed. But he killed Marshal T. Connolly. And there were five citizens killed. Uh, there was Thomas G. Ayers, the cashier of the First National Bank, and the other four down there. Now, since the Daltons lived here, some of them knew the people that were shooting at them. Um, George Cubine down here was a best friend with Emmett Dalton, and Emmett was basically in tears after he recovered from his injuries because his friend was killed in the, in the, the robbery. You know, well, I guess that's what you get when you try to be one-upping up Jesse James. There's the Condon Bank in 1892. This is before the robbery, so at least get a visual of it. And there is the Condon Bank today. It's called the Perkins Building also because a guy named Perkins designed and built it, and it is a unique structure. Standing in the middle of the street, streets on both sides of it. Uh, there's one building behind it, which is actually part of the bank. And there's the inside today. They have a museum there. Um, it's Coffeeville Historical Society. And there's the First National Bank today. It's on the corner here, and during the robbery, it was over here. So they just moved a couple of doors down the street to where they are today. And on November 9th, 2013, the Condon National Bank of Coffeeville became uh, acquired by the Community State Bank of Coffeeville, and it became the Condon Bank and Trust Company, no longer a national bank. They're currently located at 601 West 8th Street in Coffeeville. First National Bank of Coffeeville is also still in business today. Next story is a, a note from a town whose name was purchased for 40 sacks of flour. Now think about that. A town named because somebody gave 40 bags of flour? Hmm. Oh well, let's find out. Edmond is a small town located just south of Norton in northwest Kansas. Population in 1910 was 350. Today, if everybody in town is there, there are 47 people in Edmond. It's a tiny, dying town in Kansas, and we'll see that in pictures that I show a little bit later. One of the original settlers and a prominent local businessman, Noah Weaver, wanted to name the town after himself. Unfortunately, there was already a Weaver, Kansas, and we couldn't have two Weavers in the state of Kansas. So he was kind of frumped out about that, kind of bummed out about it, couldn't think out what to do. Well, in his store, there was a traveling salesman named Jack Edmund, who was from Leavenworth. Um, he said, well, how about if I give you 40 sacks of flour? You name the town after me. They made a deal, and the town was named Edmund. Okay, and amazingly, Edmund had a national bank, and this national bank was in business for a number of years. The local newspaper reported on March 19, 1908, the building for the new bank, this is the First National Bank of Edmond, is going up rapidly. It's being built of cement rock with a brick front. Okay, kind of interesting. First National Bank of Edmond, charter number 9160, was chartered in June 1908. And to celebrate the dedication of the bank, a dance was given. It always had a dance to celebrate something in a small town in Kansas. Okay, during the dance, the lights went out, and somebody fired a shot into a corner. Oh, man, talk about panic. People panicked, they shrieked, they yelled, they ran around. They started jumping out of the windows. Okay, and when they went out of the windows, they took the drapes with them. And finally, a voice said, everything is fine. That was by a guy named Stickney, which we'll get to in a second. It seems that the lights went out, the gun was fired, just all as part of the celebration. Okay, well, don't get all worked up about it. Don't run around. It turned out okay. First National Bank of Edmond was liquidated on March 10, 1925, 17 years or 15 years after it was organized, and it was succeeded by the Edmond State Bank. They had a circulation of 25000 bucks at that time, and they issued a total of almost a quarter of a million dollars in notes 
uh, fives and tens of 20, uh, 1902 date backs and plain backs. And four notes are currently known from the bank. After There were several downtown fires in Edmond. When I show you pictures of Edmond, you'll be surprised that there was enough there to burn. But um, there was. Local paper described the following after fire in 1915. The bank, made of brick, had little damage. So they were good in building it out of cement and bricks. And here's Edmond. This is at the heyday. This is Stickney's house right here. This one is a drugstore. There's the bank and there's a hotel. There are other buildings down here and there are other ones down here, but that's basically what downtown Edmond looked like at that time. Okay, let's look at it today. This is a different angle. We have, you can even see the word hotel up there. It's still on the building. And there's the bank today. Building is still there. It's still brick. Okay, and there is one of the four notes known from Edmond. Um, this one came off of eBay. It came out of, of Colorado. Um, just one of those things that happens and you never expect it to. I was real happy to get this note. Not the best of condition, but none of the notes from Edmond are in good condition. The finest is only a fine graded note. I call this a very good. So it's probably the second finest or tied for second finest. Okay, next one is a bank, a national bank in a town named after two states. Now, if you're on a borderline of two states, three states, four states, sometimes they'll name the town after the states. It's really indicative of what's going on. And the town of Conorado is located in northwest Kansas, just west of Goodland, on I-70, right on the Colorado state line. So we have it named for two states. We've got the can for Kansas and Arado for Colorado. Okay. It's, today it's a small rural town with a 2010 population of 153. I think it's less than 100 today. Uh, people are just disappearing from there. Uh, but Canarado had a much more prosperous town, was a much more prosperous town in the early 20th century, and they had a population of over 500. Now we've heard of national banks being in towns where there are small populations, but 500 seems like a very small population, even with the rural areas around it, to have a national bank. So, um, first national bank was chartered, uh, number 11 at 680, was chartered in October 1920. They didn't issue currency until 1930. Didn't want to bother with it. Got money from the Federal Reserve instead. And all the notes sent to the bank were therefore small size. Once considered a rare bank, I currently know of nine notes from here and many of these notes have defects. When I started collecting nationals about 15 or 20 years ago, there were only four notes known from Canarado. Um, they've just turned up since then. And there is a note from Canarado right there. Uh, this is from an old Lynn Knight sale. I don't have a Canarado note right now. Some interesting tales, huh? Well, again, you can do this with any state that you want to, and if you've got the inclination, the energy, it adds a great dimension to your collecting ability. Every time you can look at the notes, you can think about, wow, the bank was the third building down. It was made out of brick, and it didn't burn when they had fires. Or the Daltons robbed this bank. They had this money, and this note came from the robbery. Uh, I hope you enjoyed them. Are there any questions? Thank you.